And you may have a fair, you may have a good understanding of, of these two questions, the answers to them, but others may be not as clear. Because you may be coming to the church for many years, and you might think, well, why are we speaking on certain things? Because other people are coming in, and other people are not where you are at. And they also need to hear fundamentals. They need to hear things, and they need to be able to grow. So sometimes, you know, maybe you've been a Christian for 30 years, and, and you want to... You, you want all the sermons to be in a certain direction or you want them all to be deeper, but you've got to remember that as a body, we need to be embracing those who are coming in. In fact, you need to be bringing in those who need to come in. And the Lord can do many, many things and teach us in many ways, but this is a golden opportunity for those who don't know, for those who are seeking, for those who, who maybe have just come to, to the Lord to be able to understand and move forward. So part of my job is, is to help people to understand what God is saying, help people to understand what God is expecting from us, help people to understand who God is, help people to understand how much God loves them and how much He wants to take them forward. It's also part of my job to in, to maintain unity within this body by sowing vision and by building into your biblical understanding. And we need to have a heart, a teachable spirit, a heart that is eager to learn on no matter what topic is being presented. And when you have a heart like that, the Holy Spirit can work with you. The Holy Spirit can speak to you. Maybe even bringing truths that aren't actually spoken, but between the Holy Spirit and you personally, communication. That is the power of being together like this. Now you may feel, I've, I've said others may feel that they've got a good understanding, but you may feel a little bit behind where others are at in your knowledge and in your understanding of biblical things. But I want you to take comfort in the fact that if you stick with us, we will build into those areas and you too, over time, will build up a repertoire of understanding and the Holy Spirit working within you and you can be where others are at today. It just needs to take time. But you've got to be receiving. You've got to be hearing. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. I want to build your faith. So would you hear? Would you hear this morning? So these are the two questions that I want to look at today. What is communion and why do we do it? Good questions to ask and good questions for us to have a clear foundational understanding of. So let's start off. What is communion? Communion essentially is the reminder for us of that which Jesus has done for us on our behalf. That is what we are doing when we share in communion. As often as you, as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you remember what Jesus has done. A reminder that we would have been destined for hell. Every single one of us. There is not one person that matches God's standard of perfection outside of the blood of Jesus. Not one person. And we need to remember, that was my destiny. And I don't want to end up in hell one day. That is for sure. But that is where I was going. So I remember what Jesus has done for me. He has changed my destination, my eternal destination. And that needs to resonate within your heart. That needs to be so big to you that it overshadows everything else. My destiny has been shifted from one of hell and torment to one of blessing and glory in the presence of the Lord. All through the unselfish sacrifice of Jesus, 
And when I think of Jesus stepping down from heaven, Son of God, who created us all, and we all rebelled against Him, we all in some way rejected Him or His ways, and He stepped down to die for me. It is mind-boggling. I need to remember. I need to remember from where I have come and from what Jesus has done in me and for me. But communion is also the ratification of our marriage commitment to the bridegroom, Jesus. And what do I mean by that? Well, as I have described before, in biblical days when a man wanted to marry a woman, he needed to propose to the girl. And he would travel from his father's house where he would be living. And he would go and he would visit the girl and her father. And he would set a cup of wine on the table. And he would proceed to lay out his plan of proposition and marriage. What he could offer her and how he sees their future together. And it would be the, the girl and it would be her father. And it was up to her to decide whether this is a good plan for my life or not a good plan. She would listen to his sales pitch. And if she looked upon him and the future which he offered her favorably, then she would drink from that cup of covenant and she would enter into covenant with him. From that moment on, they were betrothed to one another. They were married without the marriage being consummated. It was a legally binding covenant that they were in, which was the same as what Mary and Joseph, the same covenant they were in when Jesus was born. Once she had drunk from that cup, signaling her acceptance of, his, of that which he is offering, the future and everything else that he can offer her, he would return to his father's house and he would prepare a place for her. And once that extension on his father's house was complete, he would return to his bride to take her to where he is in his father's house. And the young man would deliberately work hard on getting everything ready and perfect for his bride. And when the father deemed it to be complete, he would release his son to go and fetch his bride and to bring her home as his marriage partner, which then would be consummated and they would become one. And this cup that we drink represents the bridal cup as the bride drank to signal her desire to be one with her man, so too, when we receive Jesus as our Lord and Savior, we are accepting that covenant offer, that promise. And every time we drink the communion cup, we are ratifying that decision. And we are reminding ourselves of that decision that we made, however long ago, whether it was yesterday or whether it was 40 years ago. We are remembering this covenant that we are in with Jesus. Communion is us remembering that which Jesus has done. And what has he done? He has taken away the handwriting of requirement written against us and he's nailed it to the cross. And you say, what is this handwriting of requirement? Well, let's read from the book of Colossians. Colossians. Colossians 2, reading from verse 13, says, And you, that is, each one of us here, being we were dead in our trespasses, thank goodness, uh, through the blood of Jesus that has been sorted out, being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, He has made alive together with Him. We were dead. The wages of sin is death. We were dead in our trespasses. But Jesus has made us alive together with Him. We have been given a second chance. 
The person has died, his heart has stopped, and the paramedic comes, and he does his CPR, and he gets the heart going. The person has a second chance. The person has a second chance to, to live differently, to live healthily, to live with different vision and different goals in life, for he's been given a second chance. And Jesus has breathed new life into us who were dead in our trespasses. And we have been given life. We have made, been made alive with Him. Having forgiven you all trespasses. Having wiped away the handwriting of requirements that was against us. Which was contrary to us. And He has taken it out of the way. Having nailed it to the cross. That handwriting of requirements is speaking about a document that would come out of the, the court, whether it was an official court or in, in Roman times, and it stated the penalty for your crime. So your crime would be written there, and it would state the penalty you had to pay for your crime. Let's say 39 lashes was the penalty for your crime it would be stipulated on the handwriting of requirement. It is your requirement to settle that bill. That person would be brought into the place of punishment. Let's say it's the town square where he would be strapped to a pole and given 39 lashes. And once he had received his due punishment, he would be untied and released as a free man because the price was paid. And that handwriting of requirement would be nailed to a wooden pole right there in the marketplace, in the square, or wherever he was being punished. And everyone would be able to see this was the man's crime, and this was his punishment, and it is being paid in full. He is free to go. Whether he can get up and walk after 39 lashes, well, that's debatable, but he is free to go. And to live a different life as a free man. And you too had a handwriting of requirement against you. It stated your sin and it stated the punishment. And the Bible tells us that the wages of sin is death. That was your punishment. Eternal death. Mind you, not just a once off death, but an ongoing, ever going, never ending death, which nobody wants to, to go through. And it wasn't just a few lashings, that would be easy in comparison to what we deserved eternal damnation for contravening the law of God. That was, that was our handwriting of requirement. And such a such a crime could only be paid for with your lifeblood. You owed your life for the crime you had committed, meaning that you can't settle your bill and live. So what did Jesus do? He saw your repentant heart. He saw when you came to him to say, Jesus, I just can't do this. Help me. Forgive me. Wash me clean in your blood. He saw that. And he remembers that time when you came to him. And you had a heart that desired to be one with him. And he offered himself on your behalf to pay the price to offer his lifeblood when yours was due. And he became your sacrifice on your behalf to satisfy the court's ruling and then he nailed that handwriting of requirement to the cross. For Satan and the demons and the angels and for everyone to see that your price has been paid. You are a free person because of that which Jesus has done. You no longer owed that debt. That debt which you could never pay. You could never settle it. It was an ongoing debt. He paid it on your behalf and you became a free man or a free woman. This is what communion is all about. 
You choosing Jesus as your groom. You choosing Jesus as your God. The one you worship. We don't just come into this place to, as on a social level. We come into this place because we want to worship God. We come into this place because we want to worship Him together. We want to put our voices together and give Him glory. And we want to hear from Him. And we choose on a daily basis to follow in His ways. Desiring to be one with Him. And one day He will return. And He will take you to His Father's house where He has been preparing a place for you. And you will live as part of the household of God. With all the believers. With every baby that's ever been killed. With every believer that has ever died. And with every person that has been raptured. You will be part of the bride of Christ. Instead of suffering in the fires of hell. Where the worm does not die forever. Thank you. Jesus, this is what we are remembering. The truth is mind-boggling. Considering our previous fallen state and the direction we were going in, and even if, now hear me on this, even if God did nothing else for you, and I'm not saying He's not going to do more for you, but even if He did nothing else for you for the rest of your life, You should, in the knowledge of what He has already done, be able to worship Him and serve Him and, and, and stand before Him in awe and reverence for this one thing alone. But so easily we forget. And that is what communion is helping us. It's helping us to remember. I am not on my way to heaven because I am such a perfect person. I am such a great guy. No, not one of us cut it. I am on my way to heaven because of the finished work of Christ on the cross and His blood that has washed me clean. There is a phrase which has been used through history, which you've all probably heard, and that phrase is, lest we forget. Actually meaning, ensure you remember. It was first used in the Bible. Surprise, surprise, in Deuteronomy 4, I'm going to read from verse 7. It says, For what great nation is there that has God so near to it, as the Lord our God is to us, for whatever reason we may call upon Him? And what great nation is there that has such statutes and righteous judgments as are in all the law which I set before you this day? Only take heed to yourself and diligently keep yourself, lest... You forget the things your eyes have seen, and lest they depart from your heart all the days of your life, and teach them to your children and your grandchildren. Lest you forget, we share in communion to make sure we don't forget. It was then used in a line in an 1897 Rudyard Kipling poem titled Recessional. And the poem, part of the poem said, God of our fathers known of old, Lord of our far-flung battle line, beneath whose awful hand we hold dominion over palm and pine, Lord God of hosts, be with us yet, lest we forget, lest we forget. Then it was added as a final line at the end of the Ode of Remembrance, taken from Lawrence Binyard's poem for the Fallen. It was first published, this I'm quoting now, it was first published in the Times newspaper in September 1914, providing the title for this work for Brass Band. The piece aims to combine both the acoustic nature of the Brass Band medium alongside narrated passages and pre-recorded extracts to provide a moving tribute. And these are the words, they shall grow not old as we that are left grow old. Age shall not weary them, nor the years condemn at the going down of the sun and in the morning, we will remember them. We will remember them lest we forget. It is a phrase used on, in American uh, in, uh, Remembrance Day, 
And it is used in Australia on Anzac Day to remember the soldiers who fell in the war. But today, we use that phrase, lest we forget all that Jesus has done for us. We need to be those who have a good memory when it comes to what Jesus has done for us. Lest we forget. Because if we forget that, we lose the essence and wisdom and understanding of life. Which is without Jesus, we are lost. And, it, and that counts for every single person on earth. Without Jesus, we are lost. Not just lost in the direction that we are going in, but lost in the destination that we are traveling to. Communion is us remembering all that Jesus has done for us. And when I say all, we don't even fully understand all that Jesus has done for us, but we understand He has forgiven me of my sin. That sin which separated me from the Father, He has forgiven and reunited and made me one with Himself. Made me a brother of Christ, a co-heir with the Son. And... He has changed my destination from one of horribleness to one of beauty. We can look forward to eternity. We don't have to fear the other side. That which is on the other side of our final breath. Because Jesus has gone to prepare a place for us. And He's coming back. When that place is ready, He's coming back to take us to where He is. When you live with such understanding, when you live with that mindset that it's okay, because even when worse comes to worst, this side of the grave, I am better off than what I am now. When you live like that, you can live in peace. There can be turmoil in the world, but you can have inner peace because you know all is well with my soul. When we understand that we didn't deserve it, but He delighted in extending that grace to us, in ev to every single person that looks to Him and calls on His name, it is His delight to extend that grace. I think of the thief on the cross. He started off ridiculing Jesus. He didn't start off in a friendly, amenable way to Jesus. He too, like the other one on the other side, were probably hurling curses and, and spewing forth their poison. But there came a time when he was hanging on that cross that there was an awakening within him. And he started to see Jesus for who he was. Not a criminal on a cross. Not a person deserving to die. But a person that was there for others. Paying the price for you and for me. And that man on the cross who had never been to church. He was not baptized as far as I know. He... He was not living for God. He was living for himself. That's why he was on the cross. All of a sudden, he turned to Jesus and interacted in a way that released the compassion and the grace of Jesus. And even though both of them were in their final throes of life, grace was extended. And that man was brought in. He was brought in to the body. Jesus embraced him. Tonight, you'll be with me in paradise. Possibly one day, you'll get opportunity to speak to that man. 
and asked, ask him what he experienced and how he received the grace of Jesus. But the grace of Jesus is not something that you earn. You can be in the last throes of life, hanging on a cross. And when you turn to Him and call on His name, He embraces you. That is what we are remembering. That without Him, we are as hopeless as the other person on the other cross. We are as hopeless as the world that is flying towards destruction, unaware, blindfold on, careering towards a dead end, a brick wall, and mocking everybody else and Jesus and God as they go. That's how hopeless we would have been. But with Him, we have hope and we have a future. We have, forgiven, we have forgiveness and we have imputed righteousness. That means I, ha, I did not earn it. It was imputed to me. It was given to me. Bless you. And one day, when you stand before the judge of the ages, all of this that I am saying today will have immense meaning to you. You will understand that the heart of man is exceedingly wicked. And it counts for all of us. You know, we like to think that essentially we are all good people, but the Bible says the heart of man is exceedingly wicked. And that difference in understanding comes because God's, God's level of perfection, when you look from that point, everybody sure is exceedingly wicked. But when you look from the, words, from the world's point of view, you have some people that are trying to be good. But even our best intentions are like filthy rags in the eyes of the Lord. That is why we needed the blood of Jesus to wash us clean. Because for me to be clean, properly clean before the Father, it is only the blood of Jesus that can accomplish it. One day we will all stand before this judge, give an account for our life, and may you hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant. And your goodness and faithfulness comes from the Holy Spirit within, lifting you up, inspiring you, helping you to be the person that God put you on this earth to be. It's not because you are so good in yourself. It's because the God we serve is so awesome. And we have welcomed Him in to live on the inside. The God who created the universe is living within you. The sky is the limit. Don't limit God with what He wants to do in you and through you. Allow Him to rise up and to stand within you as his, in His full stature, enabling you to be that person that you need to be. And today... I'm just trying to stir you, lest you forget. Lest you start to think that it is because of me that is so good that I am on my way to heaven. Me that is so awesome that I'm, going to, that I'm forgiven for my sin. No, it is because Jesus is so beautiful. Jesus is so perfect. Jesus is so awesome. So don't miss out on the absolute goodness of God and the fullness of that which He has intended for you. Humbly we come before the throne of grace. We say, Lord, You are awesome. Come live within me because I want to be awesome in Your eyes. I want to be Your son or Your daughter. I want to stand up and make a difference in Your kingdom. But I want to do it in Your strength. I want to do it in your power. I want to do it in accordance with your will. And as we come to the communion table, we remember the awesomeness of Jesus. We remember his sacrifice that he made for us and for the rest of the world. What amazes me 
is for God so loved the world. That excludes nobody. For God so loved the world that he gave. You see, in love there is giving. His only begotten Son, that whosoever should receive him, should not perish, but have everlasting life. Whosoever, that includes every one of you. It excludes nobody. Everybody who chooses Jesus receives this gift. This gift of love, this gift of forgiveness, this gift of eternal life. You may be in here this morning. You've never received Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And you feel that today is your day. Is there anybody here? Before we get to communion and a bit of a time of worship and communion. Because we can, only, we can only partake in communion if we are part of the body of Christ. If we've received Jesus as our Lord and Savior. So I just want to give an opportunity. God is knocking on your door. He's saying, I want to come in. Today is your day. Is there anybody? Okay. So either we've all received Jesus or we've hardened our heart to receive Jesus and we say, not now, Lord. I'll do it another day. Well, may that other day be extended to you. But thank you, Heavenly Father, for your grace. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for your love. That you loved us even in our unlovely state. You loved us before we loved you. And you love us with an everlasting love. An unconditional love. A love, Lord, that it just melts our heart. You are so awesome. We want to be with you. We want to be right by your side, Lord. And we want to do all we can to prepare ourselves for for the marriage feast of the Lamb, that day when you take us home, we want to be ready. We love you. We praise you. And as we go into a time of worship now, Lord, would you anoint us with a unity? Would you anoint us, Lord, with a oneness of worship as we come together and join our voices in adoration of you? Open the, the doors of the throne room, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Come stand. Let's sing. Yes, Lord, it was of all of us you were thinking on that cross, all of the millions and billions of people who would ever live. That was your sacrifice for all of us. You took the fall on our behalf and we say thank you. You died for me. Help me to live for you. And I just lift up this congregation, Lord, and I just speak your blessing and your anointing over them for this week ahead, that they would, they would live in the fullness of what you have bought for them. That your spirit within them, Lord, would just stir them up to new heights, Lord. And you would cause each one of us to walk in the fullness of that which you have paid. We bless you. We worship you. We remember you. And at the start of this new month, Lord, with new budgets and, and new targets and everything else that your people have, would you inspire them, give them the favor, give them the blessing and anointing they need to be able to fulfill that which is on their plate. Bless them, Lord, as you provide for them. Bless them, Lord, as you, as you heal and keep healthy. Them. Bless us as only you can, in Jesus' name. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift His countenance upon you and give you peace. Be blessed.